I know the bit, a big field with, with myelofibrosis, a lot of the research goes here and then we'll hopefully help, you know, PV and ET patients eventually. So with MF, what were the biggest highlights for you? So as we think of MPN patients, so, so people have a sense there's about 300,000 to maybe 400,000 patients with ET and PV in the United States. There's probably about 20 to 30,000 with myelofibrosis. So it's a smaller group. They tend to be more ill. And because of that, we tend to test drugs there first because the need is, is very high. And then as drugs prove themselves safe or effective, we move them upstream into ET and PV. I would break down the advances in a couple ways, because there's truly probably over 20 drugs that were presented at ASH, which just the number itself should really give people a sense of, wow, you know, that, that, that's, that's really exciting. These are 20 drugs specifically being developed for myelofibrosis. And they're looking at it in, in different ways. And it's a dramatic change from before. What patients should know, one, is that they're all being tested in parallel. So that if drug seven really is enormously beneficial, you know, its path might become much quicker and people's ability to be get on it becomes much faster. People sometimes say, oh, I, you know, should I take them all? You know, clearly we're testing these in parallel, you know, and each one might be better for one person versus the other. But even if you're not on one of those trials, you may still well benefit from what we learned from that trial, whether it's beneficial or sometimes if a trial is not beneficial, we still learn, well, why did it not work? Maybe it was the right idea, but the wrong drug. Maybe it was the right drug, but it was the wrong dose. So we learned from each of these. But key takeaways are one, that there are four JAK inhibitors. And I suspect in the end, they will all be approved. There's two that are approved. Ruxolitinib and alfadratinib reduce spleen, improve symptoms, may help to improve survival. There is pacritinib, which is the most likely to become approved soon and particularly helpful for people who have a very low platelet count, but also those possibly with anemia. And then there is mamalotinib, which particularly seems to also help anemia. All of them help spleen and symptoms. I envision that if all four drugs are approved, let's say by 2023, we'll have more factors in terms of which drug we use in which patient at which time. And there will be, again, much discussion as to how one optimizes that. But that patients will likely be on a JAK inhibitor. Which one, what dose, do they switch from one or the other? All active questions. In parallel, there are conservatively 10 to 15 drugs that are looking to improve myelofibrosis in different ways that may be used along with a JAK inhibitor from the very beginning, or you start with a JAK inhibitor, you use it for a period of time, see if someone responds. And if they're not responding, then we add that other drug in after three months or four months. Or the final approach, you've been on a JAK inhibitor, you've been on one for a while, you're no longer on a JAK inhibitor, and now you're on a different drug. So as you might imagine, 10 to 15 drugs and three different ways you, we can use them. So, so many different potential combinations. None that at the moment are ones that people go out or are able to, to have their doctors prescribe. But there are an unprecedented number of clinical trials. That again, if a patient is out there and has myelofibrosis and things are not doing well, uh, or their spleen is too large, or they're not feeling well, or they're having side effects from medicines, one or more of these clinical trials may be uh, an option for them. Now, I'll highlight just a couple that are probably the closest to the approval process. There is an ongoing clinical trial of the addition of a drug called Pelabresid. These names are always so awkward, but Pelabresid, which is working on the bone marrow in a slightly different way than JAK inhibition, that is being combined Pelabresid 
uh, which is a BET inhibitor. It's a type of protein that's inhibited, plus a JAK inhibitor from the beginning uh, to see whether that is more effective than using a JAK inhibitor alone to improve spleen, to improve symptoms, anemia, fibrosis, and other things. So that uh, is an ongoing accruing study called the Manifest 2 study. There's also some key similar approaches going on with a drug called Navidaclax, uh, Parsiclisib, uh, amongst others. But the key takeaway, many things under investigation, likely everyone will be on a JAK inhibitor either alone or with a possible combination. But the data from these studies will be very important to help us determine for one individual in front of us what might be the best approach based on their age, the genetic changes with their disease, or other features of the disease. You have explained it incredibly well, thank you. I think you, you know, laid out the landscape, so that's easy to understand. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about a couple different things in follow. So one with Pelabresib, um, and you talked about how people are studying whether it, you know you use it in combination from the get go, or you know. I guess my question is: there's a question about sequence here, um, and especially when you have novel drugs or whatever. And I know they have to be studied in a particular way. I mean, there are so many studies going on parallel. But what is your what with the data you know? What is your take on? Well, how do you know if someone, and I know this is patient dependent, but how do you know if someone should start right away with, you know, just the one, or if it should be ruxolitinib and then wait till after, or if it should be ruxolitinib plus the new one right off the bat? What are the determining factors? I think at this point, we don't yet know. Uh, I think the, the data from the phase three clinical trials will be ones where we'll have to look at it very carefully to see, are there subgroups? You know, should it be everyone? You know, the, the downsides of being on a combination, it, one might be more expensive, uh, but two, there may be more side effects. So I think we'll get a better sense from, the, from looking at subgroups of patients within the phase three studies to get a sense. The current data that we used to, before the phase threes, the numbers of patients treated were enough to suggest that the combination was helpful but not enough yet to kind of answer that question. Okay, I know. I was getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> it, 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 it's a natural question, but, 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 but really a key one. You know, we view these phase three studies, the data are really going to have multiple important things that we'll look at. They're not, sometimes phase three studies are just to confirm what was seen in the phase two study. It, this, I think, is a bit more. What it confirms is two drugs better than one. But, but the other question, okay, so, so in whom? Is it everybody or is it a subset? Right, thank you. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, you had mentioned side effects. Do we know with pelabresib what the major ones are, if it's a lot more or less than the RUX? For most of these drugs, they have a tendency to potentially lower the platelets and the blood counts, which sometimes, depending upon the situation, is helpful if the counts were high. But sometimes if the counts start low, it can be, it can be a limiter. Uh, second, it can have some uh, gastrointestinal side effects. So for most of these drugs, those are the two biggest sort of culprits that, that we look at. And there, for each drug, there can be some exceptions, but blood counts, uh, GI side effects, liver function tests, those tend to be the main ones kind of across these different uh, treatments. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I had a question for you in terms of, they had one with pacritinib head-to-head uh, -head with bruxolitinib uh, for a patient population with low platelets, right? Um, I'm just really summarizing. Um, but so for you, um, did you have a strong opinion one way or the other of those results, uh, you know, and, and would it impact the way you deal with uh, your patients who might be dealing with low platelets? you know, more severe low, low platelets. Sure, so that was a study where I was a co-author. It was looking back on several of the trials we've completed with pacritinib. And I think, yes, very convincing data 
We've had for individuals with a low platelet count with procretinib, we may be able to treat them with full dose of procretinib, you know, versus frequently what is a modified dose of ruxolin uh, or, or a lower dose. Uh, and, and that difference makes an impact in terms of its effectiveness for control of spleen, control of symptoms, even safety. So yes, I think, you know, very, very compelling data. That's why I think it most likely of all of those things we're discussing, the most likely where a doctor is going to be able to prescribe it in 2022 likely would be procretinib. I know there was a lot and you, you covered a lot of these highlights. Is there anything else that you want to cover, um, whether it's an MF or ETPV for patients and their families? I would just share that, that in parallel, again, not getting into great detail, but there were multiple different abstracts really looking at the most basic biological questions. Why do people with ET and PV progress to myelofibrosis mm -hmm. and the role of various proteins and cytokines such as interleukin-13 kind of in that process? Or two, are there specific genetic changes that may be more involved with the process of progressing to acute myeloid leukemia? Whether that be a very impactful uh, study that was presented as a plenary study. So this is one of the, the most impactful studies across the entire meeting that looked at uh, TP53 and its potential role in progression to AML uh, or DUSP6, another mutation that was more associated with progression. So none of these change that we're treating patients you know, today, you know, December of 2021, but they will inform uh, things moving forward potentially. Might we treat people in a slightly different way? Might we choose stem cell transplantation earlier? Might we develop other therapies that are specific for some of these things in one way or the other? Uh, so very, very impactful uh, as they really help to inform the next wave of really uh, clinical testing. You know, I, you brought up the, the, the studies going on to figure out this progression from MF into AML. Um, I know it's early days, but I think people will be very eager to, to understand what comes out of it. So how, how much longer until the next checkpoint um, where we can maybe find the next thing about this study? So I think we learn more, the, the main kind of milestones where we really gather as a scientific community tend to be twice a year. So in the summer, both the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the European Hematology Association, they both meet at the beginning of June. And that is that, and then this ASH meeting in December are really kind of the two key touch points. Uh, when a dramatic scientific breakthrough that can be published at any time of the year, uh, of course, but this is really where we, we come together. We try to synthesize everything that is going on but we also collaborate where, again, someone's in the audience and says, boy, you know, I'm studying something that might have an impact on this. I'm studying something different, but maybe we could use it against TP53 and maybe it would help prevent AML. So that's why these meetings are so important because they really bring people together and allows the brainstorming to be at a much broader level. Um, as, we, as we wrap this, um, any last message um, to patients and their families about, I know we don't like using you know, cure as a, you know, as a word, because right now we're, it's, it's, you know, taking time, just focusing on making sure that we treat people where they are before you jump too far ahead. But, you know, people wonder. And so is that part of the conversation uh, right now? Without question, our goal is to cure the MPNs, you know, now short of cure, our goal is to control them indefinitely so that individuals can live out their normal lifespan with as near a normal quality of life as possible. So we shoot for a cure, but we don't let perfect kind of be enemy of the good. So we really work on, on both. I do think that future state, we hope that other approaches, whether they be vaccines against the abnormal cells, uh, and some studies like that are being, are being planned against cal reticulin, a particular mutation, or whether some of the advances that have been impactful in other diseases with immune therapies, cellular-based therapies such as CAR-T or others, you know, may have you know, uh, different or complementary impacts. It may not be one or the other. It may be you start with one, you get the disease more controlled, and then you come with, with a different therapy. So clearly, our goal is, is to cure the diseases. 
Uh, but but short of that, we work in parallel to see how well we control can control them as well. And not all this being done a lot in the clinical trials. And so for people, right, who maybe we talk about, well, this isn't going to come out for some time, but if people are looking for options, they can ask their providers about clinical trials that might be right for them, right? It's critical. You know, two key things. So one, if you're on a therapy, you're doing well, you and your doctor think things are stable. You know, although there's all these things evolving, it may still make the most sense to, to stay on what you're on. You know, it's working for you. All of this will, will percolate. In general, our clinical trials are for those individuals where the current state is not working. You know, you're on a therapy, or we know if we start the therapy, it's not going to have a high likelihood of success, or you've tried it and it either has side effects or it works in completely. So if you're doing well, great. Don't worry. This is, this is going to progress kind of in parallel. I tell patients the best case scenario is you're stable until we find a therapy that is so much better that even without you being worse, we replace it. That, that's the best case scenario. But if you're on a therapy and it isn't really working, you know, you should listen to our conversation and get the sense, well, maybe there is a trial I might benefit from, you know, and trials, again, there are centers doing research around the country. Like clearly, if you're in South Texas, we're, we're, we're happy to see you. Uh, but, you know, likely if you're in other parts of the country, there's a center closer to you that may have some of these trials as an option for you. And if people are in the community setting, which you know many are, um, can their doctor work with a specialist like you? You know, if they can't well, travel. Without question, you know. So I'd say many, particularly for diseases that are less common like this, many patients, particularly with more complicated diseases, you know, visit with uh, an MPN specialist, and they work along with their doctor and coming up with a plan, whether it be around, you know, the use of therapies like ropegylate interferon or others or a clinical trial. And for everyone who wants to see Dr. Mace's full conversation, just head to thepatientstory.com where you'll find human answers to your cancer questions.